All right, this video, we're going to jump into field craft. We're going to do a little bit of tactics. <clears throat> there is not a hell of a lot of written doctrine, obviously, on this from Vietnam. All I can come across is like bits and pieces of historical after action reports, historical accounts. So you can kind of get somewhat of an idea on the situation but not 100%. There is a lot of fill in the blank, blank of what would you do in that situation. So what we have here, we have our little hidden base camp assembly area up in there. And let's say we have a NVA company, okay? With maybe a uh, attached uh, platoon of Viet Cong. All right, who know the area. So the total force that we got, we're defending this area with, or have in this area, three rifle platoons, one heavy weapons platoon, a headquarters section, and a sapper squad. Now, we get word that the Allied forces, the American, the South Koreans, South Vietnamese, the Australian New Zealand, New Zealand forces are going to be attacking this assembly area. It could be from intel that we've gathered, maybe we've monitored radio communications and they were bad enough, we were able to get some information enough that we were able to piece together there was an upcoming operation. And we have to defend this location to allow us to move out of the area. Now, ideally, you want to engage the enemy with a delaying force that is as small as possible so that you can move the most amount of stuff, most amount of the people out of that area. Now, beforehand, we're going to go through and we're going to prep the area. Let's say this area up in here is elephant grass. Elephant grass could grow, grow six to ten feet in height. It was razor sharp. You could not see more than a few feet through it. These areas here are trees. More forested, more jungle type areas. This obviously is the jungled area where we put our assembly area inside. These are just patches out here. Now, one thing that they would do, or the Viet Cong and the NVA would do, is they would prep the area, like I said, they would put in some pre-made positions. So maybe we would have a heavy weapons position dug in here with maybe a couple little rifle pits and stuff alongside it. And then maybe we would do the same over here. Because for whatever reason, we determined that they'd have to move through here to hit us because this is the best terrain for them to do it where they're not going to get bogged down. So we get some other rifle pits and stuff in here. Rifle pits, two-man foxholes. Maybe we do the same over here. Now, it doesn't mean all of them are going to be occupied, but we prep the area. Foxholes spread out in here too. Now to add to the confusion, you can have, and it was common, inside areas like this where it was really tall grass, maybe you'd have a string of spider holes. These spider holes could be used to close off gaps like this. Maybe you'd even have just a few spread out in here at random. And they would be marked so that you could find them more easily. How would you mark it? Let's say a uh, tall stick stuck in the ground so that you could find it a little bit easier. Maybe a little piece of cloth on that. And then when that position would have to be occupied, you'd remove that stick. So we have an armored cavalry unit that is attacking. We have an M551 Sheridan, which was a light tank, is in the lead. And then behind that, we would have our M113 A calves, 
armored uh, cavalry vehicles. These were 113s that usually had uh, additional uh, gun positions up top. You had the main gun, which was usually a 50 cal, and then you would have one or two M60s in the back, and then potentially a few troops would be riding along also. They typically would be riding on top. Maybe you would have a few of them strung out behind you, right behind the vehicle, in case of booby traps or mines. So we get word the enemy's going to be coming through. We decide to send forward some of the heavy weapons, maybe uh, a team of the sappers, and maybe one rifle platoon, maybe two. So for heavy weapons, what would we want to push forward? We'd want to be as light as possible, so lighter recoilless rifles. And we're probably going to want to hit them in locations where we can see better. They, ne not, they can't necessarily. So maybe we put in a recoilless here. Maybe we put in a recoilless here. And then we decide up here, we'll just put a machine gun. Inside these spider holes, or at least some of them, We'll put in troops. Armed with AKs. There are three uh, magazines inside their Tricom chest rigs. And a light anti-tank weapon. Potentially a captured M72 law rocket. And we would have infantry spread out in some of these foxholes also. Now, depending on the terrain, if you can guarantee an enemy would travel down a particular area, that would be a location you would put landmines and so forth. <clears throat> if you can't guarantee the enemy would go through that area, they weren't as likely to put a landmine there because they only have a limited stock of them. They weren't infinite. They didn't have an unlimited supply. They were coming in from outside the country, so they only would have so many of them. They would also steal as many as they could from around our bases. Now in this situation, we know that they're going to be coming through here. So maybe we have the sappers go through and put in uh, our lazy W of anti-tank mines according to whatever doctrine we have for the spacing and so forth. And I tank and we would booby trap some of them. Why? Because we want to get that lead vehicle stopped up here, keep them caught inside the kill zone. Would you have any personnel mines in here? Potentially you could, but they would be used to protect your heavy weapons to prevent the enemy from assaulting and to capture them. You want to buy those weapons teams a little bit extra time that they would be able to get out of the area for when they get the call to withdraw. Now you're probably saying, well, what about mortars? Well, let's say if we got any mortars, they're going to be back here. We won't necessarily have all of them. Maybe we'll have two 60 millimeters designated for help. And we would have a forward observer up a tree with a pair of binoculars potentially yelling down the fire corrections. Maybe he has a field telephone up there with him and he's calling it down to their little uh, mini fire direction center giving them the fire corrections. So these guys come in at the uh, call to initiate 
right, a person in charge, and you're probably going to have multiple people that are going to be told, you know, hey, you can initiate it, you can initiate it, here's the criteria. We get our initiation. If someone has a clear shot on the APCs, they're going to do it. Hit those APCs, and remember the fuel tanks in the M113A1s at this time were internal. You wanted to hit them on the left side rear because that's where the fuel tanks were. They get hit with that rocket. Big kaboomy. Guys riding on top will get shot off thrown through the air. This guy here, after he does his uh, firing of the rocket, maybe he's told at that point he's supposed to DD. DD means get out of there. So he heads off through the grass as quick as possible trying to take a fake trail away before he comes in and joins them. These guys over here because they're on a heavy weapon, a recoilless rifle, they're going to acquire the next target as fast as possible. If it looks like they're not going to be able to acquire a target fast enough, they will uh, change positions, either going to this, or maybe they're going to go up to here, wherever the person in charge of that team determines their best uh, location for acquiring another target. Yeah. Now maybe these guys back here, Maybe one of them could uh, get a shot in, or maybe we have a couple sappers back here with uh, AKs and satchel charges. That APC gets close enough, Mr. Sapper pops the igniter on that satchel charge, gets out when it's, you know, starting to go past them. He tosses that satchel charge up through the open uh, cargo hatch up on the top that the troops had their legs dangling in. Well, satchel charge goes off. Also big kaboomy. After he would toss that satchel charge, he jumps back into that hole if he's still alive and wasn't taken out by one of the gunners. This guy here would either continue going forward until he would hit one of these mines or one of these recoilless rifles was able to get a hit on that engine compartment in back and knock it out. Any troops that dismount, they're starting to push through, they're starting to assault. That's where you had riflemen in here and machine gun up in here. If it gets too hot for these guys over here, they're getting online about to assault through. He gets a signal. And he starts sweeping, having his little sector stakes, and he just goes through and he starts chopping grass and people that are hiding in it trying to move through. This guy here, if he can get in a shot, he'll get in a shot. If he can't get a shot, he would fall back on whatever path he was given to link up. Sooner or later, the counterinsurgent is going to get control of the battlefield. When that happens, these guys will pull back. The first thing out is going to be your heavy weapons. So the recoilless rifles and the tripod mounted machine guns. What type of machine gun? Think of a uh, SG-43 and an SGM. You know, maybe a uh, 1919. 30 caliber that they captured from the Arvins. But first off, these guys that are farther into the fight, they are going to pull out and take their little evacuation route back. And then some of these riflemen will stay behind to cover as everyone is following with. Over here, same thing. 
the cordless rifle out and back and then everyone else eventually will link up and pull out. This heavy machine gun would also fall back never going directly to the base camp being covered by riflemen and then he falls back either also or dies. While this is going on down here back at your assembly area the people that are not committed in this fight they are packing everything up as fast as they can all the wounded all the ammunition all the extra weapons as much food as they can getting it together and then they are pulling back to their fallback position their next location that was designated either it could be a rally point to meet up with the defensive forces or they're moving to the next base camp location that has already been pre-scouted you know and they determined hey this is going to work we can get water from this spot here we can uh, put in some additional positions here maybe they'll even have had a uh, team or a uh, squad have gone through and already dug positions in that area that they could easily go back to and uncover and jump inside. Obviously the mortars are going to cover until either they've used all the number of rounds that they were told to use or they get told to fall back then they grab everything they can they meet up with the uh, rest of the unit and they fall back out of that area. How many troops would probably be involved down on the ambush and that stuff? Hopefully a platoon, maybe not too many more. Like I said, if you had any sappers, that would be part of it. They would be the ones responsible for handling the satchel charges and that stuff. Your average soldier, they can handle the RPGs and the RPGs RPG 7s and that stuff, if you had them, they'd be in these positions here, not necessarily inside spider holes. <laughs> Maybe up here by this uh, machine gun, you had an RPG up here with that rifleman, just so you had an additional anti-tank. But that's to give you a bit of an idea on how to do a defense as a gorilla. A gorilla is not necessarily going to do it the same way a conventional army does. He's not going to go and put in long trench systems and bunkers and that stuff and tank traps and everything. If he's able to, if the terrain allows for it, he will. But he's going to tailor his defense to the, to the terrain that he's in and the anticipated enemy action. A gorilla will probably end up digging more positions then are actually going to get used. And then when they're not in use, they're covered up. You have uh, branches put over the top, and then you have grass mats put over that, and then you have a bunch more grass tossed over it to camouflage it so no one knows it's there. Maybe you'll have a little marker that'll designate it, say a certain pile of rocks that you come up with, or a mark on a tree, whatever, that will designate that the position's there. Now, what about the mines that were put in by the sappers to prevent a direct assault? Those would stay there. They would get left behind. They would only get removed if the battle has not occurred, and then the sappers would take them with them to the next location. But it's always possible they could get the order to just leave them there. Things to think about. How would you conduct a defense of a base camp? And keep in mind, you don't want to stay there if the enemy is coming to clear that area. Because he can be involved down here, and he may say, fuck it, call for an airstrike on everything up in here. Or call in for artillery, so you're not going to want to stay there you're going to want to move out as fast as possible. The North Vietnamese used to practice that on a regular basis on how to bug out of a camp as quick as possible, grabbing everything and getting out of there, and they would leave damn little behind, if anything. If anything was left behind, it was typically camouflaged inside a bunker, 
or a pit in the ground that was covered up that the enemy could walk right over the top of it and not even realize that they are walking over the top of, say, 20 crates filled with rifle ammo and 10 crates of mortars. And then that stuff would get picked up later, later on after the Americans would leave. Now, the counterinsurgents, knowing that the enemy could potentially leave stuff behind, a common mission for the engineers was to come through with metal detectors, check the area, and if they found a large uh, indication, start digging there, and then that would be potentially when they would find those large caches of ammunition. We did the same thing in Iraq and in Afghanistan after an area would be cleared, call up the engineers, We'd pull out the mine detectors, which are just metal detectors, scan the area, see if we found any big indications, which could be hidden weapons, hidden ammunition. Now, for all my engineer brothers and the Patriot Militia Movements, always remember SAONs.